Good morning, uh, uh, everyone. Uh, I will talk about congenital vertebral malformations. We should learn about the incidence associated anomalies, thoracic cage anomalies, types and classifications, clinical field syndrome, and management. So we're talking about congenital scoliosis, which is a lateral curvature of the spine. Most congenital scoliosis is often recognized at birth, but more subtle spinal defects can remain undetected. Incidence is 0.5 to 1 per 1,000 live births. Vertebral growth is very active during the first months of life, slowing down after the age of 6 and 7 until the peak of puberty. Knowing the active growth periods in child development should aid the surgeon to decide about the proper timing of treatment interventions. Etiology, genetic and environmental factors are involved. Both the family history is found in 1 to 8 percent of cases. It's generally non-hereditary. Uh, the etiology is due to insult during the fifth to eighth week of gestation. Associated anomalies, the most common associated anomaly is congenital urinary tract uh, anomalies notably uh, renal agenesis. That's why you should do ultrasound abdomen before the surgery. Cardiac anomalies are common as well, and echocardiogram is a must. Intraspinal anomalies are associated with congenital vertebral malformations in 30% of the cases, and we need to do an MRI before the surgery to rule out these abnormalities. The diagnosis starts with through uh, physical examination and history taking. History taking include the perinatal period. Examination should focus on the sagittal and coronal balance of the patient. You should also note any pelvic or head tilt. You should look at the shoulder balance. You should assess also the rib cage. Neurological examination should include the muscle power sensations and test for any abnormal reflexes. Patient back should be inspected for abnormal hairy batches or pigmentations. Physical examination also should uh, find any asymmetrical calves or cavus feet which are manifestations of spinal dysraphism. Radiological investigations should include x-rays, PA and lateral and after the age of one year it should be in a standing position. CT to evaluate complex deformities an MRI to rule out any intraspinal anomalies such as syringomyelia and diastematomyelia. Winter classification is based on embryological uh, classification. There are three main types, formation failures, segmentation failures, and mixed formation and segmentation failures. Thus, we can encounter different morphologies as follows, hemivertebra, which can have a mobile segment only on one side and in this situation is called semi-segmented hemivertebra or has one disc above and one disc below the vertebra and it is called in this situation fully segmented hemivertebra and it has the worst prognosis. Incarcerated vertebra has no discs around and has a good prognosis. Segmentation failure can be partial or complete, unilateral or bilateral. Butterfly vertebra is a sagittal defect in the vertebral body caused by failure of fusion of the two lateral chondrification centers during embryogenesis. It's often encountered in patients with multiple spinal anomalies. Congenital kyphosis also classified as failure of formation or failure of segmentation. Kawakmi classification is another classification worth mentioning. And it's based on the preoperative 3D morphologic analysis for determining the optimal strategy for the treatment. Type 1 is only one anomaly in the whole spine. Type 2, multiple anomalies. Type 3, multiple anomalies with combination of formation and segmentation defects. Type 4 is only segmentation anomalies. Rib fusions are common occurrences with congenital scoliosis. It may result from failure of segmentation of ribs. You can have missing ribs or extra ribs. In severe forms, it's called thoracic insufficiency syndrome, such as 
June syndrome. These cases are best treated by expansion of the chest as well as of the scoliosis uh, by vertebral expandable prosthetic titanium ribs or VIPTOR, and we will discuss that uh, at the end of the treatment section. Klippelfield syndrome is a syndrome characterized by short neck, limited range of motion in the neck, torticollis, low hairline, and may uh, also have congenital high scapula or springle shoulder. These vertebral malformations anomalies can be in the form of massive fusion in the cervical spine or limited fusions and multiple fusions in the cervical, thoracic, and number spine. The problem is with fusions in the cervical spine, there is always areas of hypermobility above the fusion which may cause uh, may cause uh, chordomalacia and weakness. We have to correlate the location and the prognosis and according to McMaster, vertebral malformations that are located in the thoracic and thoracolumbar curves ha has the, uh, the greatest progression and are thus associated with poorest prognosis. Also, we should know what type that carry the worst prognosis and what type that we can also treat uh, with observation. Fully segmented hemivertebra, which has two gross plates, with contralateral bar has the worst prognosis, followed by unilateral segmented bar, unsegmented bar. Last but not least, the incarcerated hemivertebra has the best prognosis. Treatment lines, observation, prophylactic surgeries, corrective surgeries, cross preservation surgeries, and treatment of neglected cases. Periodic observation. You bring the child every 6 to 12 months and you do an x-ray in standing position after one year. Bracing is usually non-successful and is not appropriate for cases such as uh, unilateral uh, segmentation bar or not successful also in cases of congenital kyphosis. Bracing may be successful with cases that has long flexible curves above and below the anomalies. Prophylactic surgery. This includes in situ fusion and hemiepiphysiolysis. In situ fusion is done with posterior fusion, whether without instrumentation, whether without anterior surgery. The problem with in situ fusion is that the course and progression is unpredictable. Hemiepiphysiolysis is also one of the prophylactic surgeries. It's a convex gross arrest procedure. It, it is best to be done before the age of five, uh, in curves less than 50 degrees, no kyphosis, and the concave side opposite the vertebral anomalies has to be intact with no fusion bars. Because hemiepiphysiolysis is based on that after arresting the fusion on the convex side, the concave side has to overrun the convex side, thus correcting the deformity in the long run. After the surgery, the patient should be immobilized in a cast or hard brace. And also, uh, uh, it, is, it has unpredictable uh, outcome, uh, like the inside of fusion. Hemivertebral resection is a corrective surgery aiming at resecting the hemivertebra and, uh, and correcting the deformity. The classic indication is rigid decompensated spinal deformities. These procedures used to be done through uh, anterior surgery, either by a thoracotomy or laparotomy. Nowadays, it's increasingly done through uh, all posterior procedure uh, with resection of the pedicle and complete resection of the vertebral body from behind and instrumenting above and below the resection area. Here is an example of a five years old female patient diagnosed with hemivertebra at L2. The workup included uh, preoperative uh, ultrasound and echocardiogram, preoperative CT scan uh, for accurate uh, uh, planning of the surgery, and MRI to rule out any anomalies within the spinal cord. 
We utilize the combined approach. First, we uh, position the patient on uh, lateral position. We uh, resected the L2 vertebra through a laparotomy and retroperitoneal approach. And after that, we performed uh, or completed the resection posteriorly and we uh, instrumented the spine with short levels above and below. The patient is doing well so far. Cross preservation techniques. The use of growing rods in congenital scoliosis can be utilized in cases that develop long secondary curves. When lung fusion is not practical due to remaining gross potential of the patient, may be combined with limited apical convex fusion information defects. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, Rahim. I'm going to talk about um, scoliosis and overview in this Qasr uh, Aini uh, Spine Surgery Review course. Um, scoliosis comes from the word scolius, which means bent, slanted. Uh, it's a Greek word and it's first described by hypocrites and by Galen. Um, scoliosis is best defined as a complex three-dimensional deformity characterized by coronal, sagittal, and horizontal plane uh, deviation. Um, so many uh, causes for scoliosis, the commonest being idiopathic, uh, but also many neuromuscular diseases, whether upper motor or lower motor neuron uh, lesions can cause deformity because of muscular imbalance, neurofibromatosis, congenital anomalies, soft tissue disorders like collagen like Marfan syndrome, tumors, infections, trauma, and some of the osteochondral dystrophies and metabolic disorders as well. Um, the, um, the main thing that we're gonna talk about here is idiopathic scoliosis, and um, it's best to, uh, classified according to the age of onset, uh, either by um, commonly uh, described as infantile, juvenile, or adolescents, but the more recently it has been divided according to the age of onset into early onset, that is the onset of scoliosis before the age of five or late onset uh, after that. Um, the etiology uh, of idiopathic scoliosis used to be so many theories about it, but uh, recently genes have been identified, genes that, um, uh, that either initiated the, the, the deformity and also other genes that are responsible for the progression of the scoliosis. Um, just to touch on early onset scoliosis, because quite honestly, it's an entity on its own now, um, and this is the real challenge that spine surgeons face. And uh, the problems with this early onset scoliosis, that scoliosis before the age of five, is that there is a very high risk of progression because the child is growing. So as the deformity increases, also um, during this early onset of the deformity, um, this is the time where the lung is developing and um, it has a, 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 or may have a severe affection of respiratory function. Also, the small size of the child uh, causes problems when we decide to instrument to do something surgical about it. And finally, the problems associated with spinal fusion, the surgery that is classically performed for any spine deformity, this young age leads to a shorted trunk and with also um, the, the lack of uh, vertical height gained during growth, which also affects the development of the lung. Um, regarding the pathological anatomy, as we said, it's a three-dimensional deformity. So there is a lateral translation in the AP plane. There is also a commonly a hypokyphosis or the lack of thoracic kyphosis uh, in the thoracic uh, sagittal plane, and also an axial rotation uh, on the horizontal plane. With time, the vertebrae, because of asymmetric loading, leads to a vertebral deformation as well. Um, when you are seeing a patient with scoliosis, um, you need to assess him in different uh, positions. You should see his gait and um, examine him while standing from the front, from the side, and from the back. You should see the patient and look at the level of the pelvis while he's sitting compared to the standing level, and also ask him to bend forwards at 90 degrees and look at tangentially along his spine to look at uh, asymmetric ribs, and also supine uh, with the neurological examination. Um, these are a couple of uh, figures you can see on um, the shoulder 
look at the shoulder level, look at the prominence of the scapula and the asymmetry of the, of the loin, as well as the truncal shift to the right side. And this also there is a, this picture, they can see a lateral translation onto the right side uh, uh, of the trunk, as well as a, uh, a rib pump, as, as well as a, uh, an elevated right shoulder. Looking at the front, you can also see the asymmetry of the shoulders, the waist asymmetry, and also the level of the pelvic bones. Um, also at the front in girls, you may see um, breast asymmetry related to the asymmetric shape of the thoracic cage because of the spinal deformity. Another picture showing asymmetry, you can see the right breast smaller than the left. With the patient bent forwards, you can see um, the uh, differences uh, looking tangentially. As the pictures show, you can see the rib hump and the loin hump on the left side. Um, neurological examination is so important. Uh, you should do a full sensory motor and reflex examination. A few things that you have to look at, uh, particularly um, the abdominal reflexes, which can uh, uh, predict the presence of a possible uh, intradural or intraspinal anomaly like dystematomyelia or tethered cord syndrome, uh, as well as other neurological signs which may be a cause uh, of the disease like Friedreich's ataxia with the high arch uh, of the foot uh, uh, and also other neurological diseases. When it comes to radiological assessment, um, you should obtain the classic four uh, radiographic uh, examinations, full length whole spine standing x-rays, both in AP and lateral, and also a full-length whole spine, supine AP, right and left bending x-rays. The aims of, of this radiological assessment is to assess the severity of the curve by measuring the cob angles, as I will show you in a minute, and also to assess the flexibility of the curve um, by doing the, the severity and the topography of where the curves are and the magnitude and flexibility, you'll be able to classify the curve patterns into different uh, patterns of the curves, and finally, um, looking at the level of the iliac crest and looking at the research site and assess the skeletal maturity. This is an example of a full-length x-ray. Um, you can see here the spine and the frontal plane is divided into three zones, the proximal thoracic, the main thoracic, and the thoracolumbar. Lumbar, you can see the three areas. When you look here at the proximal thoracic, the main thoracic, and the thoracolumbar lumbar, each measured with a comb angle. Uh, the comb is, is the angle measured between the uppermost bent vertebra and the lowermost bent vertebra in the three zones, which is called the upper end vertebra and lower end vertebra of each curve. You also have measurements done in the sagittal plane, mainly assessing the presence of thoracic hypokyphosis or otherwise, and also the area of this thoracolumbar junction to assess the uh, structurality or the severity of the curve. You also uh, have a supine side bending. This is a right bending curve, and you look at the, how uh, the curve bends, and you compare this cob angle compared to the standing axis to assess the flexibility, and also uh, to, the, to the other side where you assess the lumbar curve and the proximal thoracic curves as well. Now, uh, why do we do an MRI in scoliosis? We want to rule out an intraspinal anomaly, of course. This is rare, in, in uh, luckily, in idiopathic scoliosis, but it can still happen. And um, the indications are, um, the more important indications are pre the presence of an atypical curve, like a left thoracic curve, the presence of thoracic kyphosis, again, an uncommon pattern in idiopathic curves, so there may be an abnormal neurological uh, disease there. Uh, uh, definitely uh, an asymmetric abdominal reflexes or hyperreflexia or clonus in the lower limbs or wasting of the hands is another uh, indication. And of course, the presence of neurofibromatosis scoliosis and congenital scoliosis is an absolute must. I have to say that there are other surgeons who will do MRI for all patients who are going to undergo surgery just in case to be sure and to, to increase the safety of the surgical uh, procedure. Now, um, the school screening programs, uh, there has been an interest in screening kids um, using what is, is known as the one-minute test or the forward bend test by uh, young doctors, nurses, and even health practitioners going to schools to screen for early detection of scoliosis. Um, there have been um, different enthusiasm about it, um, different opinions whether it's valuable or not, but I think it's still valuable, particularly in uh, countries 
or underdeveloped like our own country where uh, the kids may pass unnoticed and present with severe curves later on. Now, having done the clinical and radiological examination, and it has been shown that uh, this is an idiopathic scoliosis, there are uh, different classifications. The old and classic one was the King Mo classification, now replaced by the Lanky classification. There is also a Chinese one called the PUMC, uh, and the, the more recent, the three-dimensional classifications. Without going into much of a detail into these classifications, um, these are all about how the patterns of the curves are. They are important in communicating among surgeons uh, to describe curves to one another so we can communicate easier. And they're also valuable, uh, particularly the lengthy one, in selecting the fusion levels while doing a corrective surgery for such a scoliosis. Now we go to the management part. Um, the management options are either follow-up, braces, and surgery. Casts are only done for early onset, and as I told you earlier, I decided not to go into this because it deserves um, a, a lecture on its own, early onset scoliosis, and Professor Fawaz will talk about congenital, which is part of the early onset curve. So we are either talking about follow-up, braces, or surgery. Follow-up is uh, indicated only in small curves, which are normally below 25 degrees, and that have shown low risk of progression. The frequency of follow-up will depend, again, on the chance of progression, and um, uh, it can be done either every four or six months, depending on uh, the age of the patient uh, and the previously documented progression. Curves that are larger than that, between 25 and 35 degree curves, who have shown a recently documented progression, and who are willing to wear the brace at least 12 hours a day um, and have a cosmetically acceptable curve and who are still skeletally immature, either is at 0, 1 to 2, uh, are eligible for bracing. Uh, different types of braces without going into too much detail about it. You can read into it if you want to, um, but braces have to be worn at least 12 hours a day or 23 hours depending on the protocol. There are braces that are used at night as well so many different protocols aiming at mainly holding progression. A brace is hardly correct first, but they may be successful in preventing the progression of a curve. What about surgery? Surgery is indicated for curves who are sizable, and um, normally the, the figure given is 40 degrees. However, the cosmetic effect of a curve is important. Uh, you may not operate on a 45 degree curve, but operate on a 35, another curve which has a significant cosmetic deformity, particularly truncal shift, which is very disfiguring, or the presence of a loin or a rib hump because of a severe rotation. And also, um, curves that are 40 with, uh, or above uh, with a high risk of progression uh, may call for earlier surgery compared to others who have shown to be uh, more benign in the slowness of their progression. The types of surgeries of corrective surgeries given for idiopathic scoliosis curves are either posterior surgery, which has become the most common surgery used nowadays, particularly with the advent use of old pedicle screw instrumentation. The advantage of using pedicle screws is that it not only gives a strong hold of the vertebra, but it also uh, screws are inserted into the vertebral bodies, so they have control over the anterior elements of the spine. And with different instrumentation techniques, you can actually not just correct the lateral translation and the sagittal hypokyphosis, but also you can perform derotation. So you can correct all three elements of the deformity in very uh, degrees, of course. Um, anterior surgery still has a role to play, again, depending on uh, the experience of the surgeon and his preference, but they are still uh, somewhat used in lumbar curves uh, and, uh, in, and in severely hypokyphotic thoracic curves where anterior surgery gives an advantage of restoring uh, thoracic kyphosis. Anterior surgery includes discectomy, which shortens the front of the spine, and with the insertion of the screws into the vertebral bodies and the instrumentation, we may restore thoracic kyphosis in severely hypokyphotic thoracic curves. Um, this can also be done thoracoscopically uh, in some centers. Um, uh, the, the, the enthusiasm for Anterior surgery was higher in uh, the 80s and 90s because uh, at the time there was no pedicle screws used 
for scoliosis, and um, it gave um, uh, a chance for, to shorten the levels of diffusion and spare levels for motion in the lumbar spine. But with the advent of pedicle screws, we can shorten the instrumentation and correct the deformity quite well in all three planes. So anterior surgery is less common nowadays. Combined anterior and posterior surgery is rarely used now, and combined surgery was common in severe curves above 70 to 90 degrees in the past because it was um, to performed by doing an anterior uh, discectomy and release, thought to uh, give uh, more mobility of the severe curve. But nowadays, with the posterior releases and the facetectomies, and with the strong instrumentation, we hardly do any anterior release anymore. Um, these are a couple of examples. This is a right thoracic curve. On the right side, you can see the x-rays, patient standing. This is the lateral view. You can see the thoracic hypokyphosis and the bending curves show not much of a flexible thoracic curve, and the lumbar curve is reasonably mobile. And um, the, the surgery uh, involved posterior instrumentation with pedicle screws, a good correction, and you can see on the left side uh, the hump view, which you can see the, the preoperative hump on the top with the prominence of the ribs, and after the correction of the surgery, and without doing any excision of the ribs, you can see the more or less uh, level uh, thoracic cage and the improvement of the rib pump. Also, this is another curve where there is a major uh, main thoracolumbar uh, uh, lumbar curve and a, a secondary thoracic curve uh, with the bending films, and you can see the post-operative instrumentation of both curves and an excellent correction compared uh, comparing the right photograph with the left uh, uh, photograph, uh, so an excellent correction. So uh, to conclude, uh, the take-home messages, uh, remember that uh, scoliosis is a three-dimensional deformity. Uh, the age of onset before the age of five is a real problem and it's a real challenge to manage. Uh, idiopathic scoliosis is a diagnosis of exclusion after excluding all other causes listed in the table that I have shown you earlier on in the presentation. Um, you have to do a proper clinical and radiological assessment of these patients uh, and uh, the management options available to us are follow-up, bracing, and surgery, depending on the effect, the effect of this deformity on the appearance, the effect uh, on uh, the overall truncal balance, and um, the severity of the curve using the cob angle measurements, and also the risk of progression and the rate of progression thereof. I thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to, um, to take your questions whenever you want to.